Okay, please take your seats. Good evening. I'm Doug Arnold. I'm the director of the Institute for Mathematics and its Applications here at the University of Minnesota. And I'm delighted to welcome you to the third lecture in our Math Matters public lecture series for 2006-2007. I'm delighted today to have with us Martin Golubitsky. Marty is the Cullen Distinguished Professor of Mathematics at the University of Houston. He studied first at the University of Pennsylvania and then got his doctorate in mathematics from MIT in 1970. He's worked at Houston most of his career the last 25 years with some major visiting positions of which I'll mention uh, at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, at the Courant Institute in New York University, and at our own Institute for Mathematics and its Applications. He's well known in the mathematical sciences community for his work in the areas of dynamical systems, bifurcation theory, symmetry, and chaos, and applications of those theories to many different areas, of which I'll mention his work on animal gates and on neuroscience. Mathematicians also know him for five textbooks, four graduate textbooks and one undergraduate textbook he's written in those areas. And the world at large knows him through two uh, popular books that he co-authored. With Mike Fields, he wrote Symmetry and Chaos, which has been translated into several languages. And with uh, Ian Stewart, he published Fearful Symmetry, or Is God a, co a Geometer, which he co-authored with Ian Stewart and which has appeared in uh, eight different languages. Marty's received many honors, and I'll only mention a couple of them. He's been honored with fellowship in both of the scholarly organizations whose initials are AAAS, namely the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, and uh, last year, the very prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He also just finished a two-year term in what's one of the most important uh, services you can do as a professional applied mathematician, namely he was the president of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, our professional organization, SIAM. And I'm really happy to have him here now because not only is he a great mathematician who cares a lot about math and its applications, but he also has a passion about communication of mathematics to the public. And I'm very looking very much forward to his lecture, Patterns, Patterns Everywhere. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in Minneapolis. I always like coming once a year to sample winter. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want to say anything that would get you upset, but on Saturday before I left, I went and had lunch outside in a nice uh, restaurant. Anyway, it's, uh, it's really quite nice to be here. And uh, what I want to talk about today are patterns. And so I have to tell you what patterns are. Uh, and in fact, um, last year I was at a meeting at a rival institute in Cambridge and uh, the, uh, on pattern formation. Many of the uh, world's leaders in pattern formation were present. And I went around and asked them, well, why do you study patterns? And after a while, uh, I figured out that there were four main themes for this. And I'd like to uh, present these to begin uh, the talk. So the first is that they are surprising and they're pretty. And people who uh, work in the field really like the fact that they're looking at something which is uh, quite, uh, quite nice to look at. Uh, there are two physicists, Stephen Morris and uh, Mike Gorman, uh, Steve at uh, the University of Toronto and Mike at the uh, University of Houston, who helped me to assemble some of these pictures. Uh, so here's uh, an example of patterns, mud planes, uh, and there's this very sort of regular pattern, hexagonal pattern, that appears as the uh, mud flats dry. And you sort of wonder where it comes from. Uh, a very similar pattern is uh, what occurs on leopard spots. And uh, to get some of the physics in here, um, this is an experiment called the, uh, a picture of an experiment called the Baynard experiment, it's a convection. You take a layer of fluid, that is, you put some water in a beaker, and you heat it from below. And when the temperature is very small on the bottom, uh, uh, the heat just conducts straight up. But if you raise the temperature, after a little while, the water starts to boil, as it were. You get convective motion. 
And this transition from conduction to convection is uh, what people have studied for many years. And uh, indeed, in, you can end up with this very regular pattern, uh, this hexagonal pattern. And, and some people feel this is the experiment that actually started the field of pattern formation uh, when Baynard did this in the early 1900s. Okay, a different kind of patterns in the sand dunes in the Namibian desert. Uh, these very straight lines, or essentially straight lines that appear. Um, but you see that in animals also, and zebra stripes. And also in the convection experiments you can get these. So you, you get these kinds of patterns appearing in many different physical, biological uh, situations. Now, here's one that you might, you know, find a little bit surprising. Uh, some experiments that Mike Gorman does at uh, Houston. Uh, you have a uh, burner, which you just send gas up through and ignite the top, and the flame just sits up there, flame front. And if you take a picture looking down, then at different, if you have different fuel or different richness, what's called stoichiometry, or different flow rate of the fuel, you get different patterns appearing. And here's one, you can't see this very well. Um, but what I like about this experiment is it's a good way to see not only static patterns, but dynamic patterns. So I'm going to show you, uh, Mike uh, and his group uh, put together a film, and I'm going to take three snippets from that film. Uh, just uh, some will be stationary to begin with, and then some uh, rather interesting dynamic patterns. And, uh, surprise if you know what the music is. Maybe this explains why people might be interested in patterns. Uh, they're just a variety, and you wonder, well, what's behind all of this? OK, uh, so that was the first theme. It's pretty. It's nice. It's uh, pleasant to look at. Uh, well, the physicists uh, kept using the words emergent phenomena and self-organization. And I just give you an idea what this might mean, uh, the British mathematician um, Alan Turing in his uh, last work in 1952, uh, posited that uh, patterns, uh, that morphogenesis is due to pattern formation in living systems. And people have been arguing back and forth of whether this is actually correct, but it was an interesting way of looking at emergent phenomena. Another way to say this is that patterns often provide function, and I'll show you some examples of that in a moment, and that there's science behind these patterns, and I'll, I'll try to explain that in, in terms of an experiment. So here's a pattern uh, that we obviously use in, um, or misuse, depending on your attitude, uh, with fingerprints. So the patterns are more or less the same, but not exactly the same, and it's not, not exactly the same that's important. Or uh, if uh, the weather, which I assume is important here, you'd like to know when the low is coming in. So uh, we're used to looking at patterns like this. Uh, now I'm going to use these patterns of columnar joints, which when I saw this, I was really quite incredulous. Uh, I don't know whether you can see these long um, 
columns that appear. And this is uh, on an island off the coast of Scotland, but if you prefer the Snake River, the same formation occurs, uh, these uh, nice columns. And how, where does this come from? Well, Steve Morris uh, decided to try this out with an experiment. So of course he, uh, 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 tongue in cheek, took cornstarch and wet it and then brought in the sun, these are actually two suns, and uh, dried the cornstarch and then found that depending on how fast the uh, cornstarch was drying, that is how high the lamps were off of the beaker, at certain places you would get the columnar joints forming. So from this you could posit that the reason that these joints appear in different places may have to do with the rate at which uh, the rocks, uh, well, how it sedimented or dried in, at some point in the past, in geological past history. So you get some insight into where these patterns are coming from. In any case, that's uh, what I would call the physics uh, use of patterns. Uh, now we sort of start to transition between physics and mathematics. Uh, change in patterns uh, can provide tests for mathematical models. And uh, there's really a classic example of this uh, in the Navier-Stokes equations. Now, many of you probably don't know uh, the partial differential equation, which I've written down here. Uh, you don't have to know it, obviously, it's just for fun. Think of this as a pattern, uh, and it's pretty to look at. Uh, okay, so wh what, what this is is basically Newton's laws for fluid, for a fluid. And Navier uh, wrote these down in 1821, uh, sort of uh, in, a, in a not terribly rigorous way. 35 years later, Stokes re-derived it in a rigorous fashion. But it wasn't until 1923, notice over 100 years after Navier originally wrote these uh, equations down, that there was experimental confirmation for the Navier-Stokes equations. And I want to tell you how this happened, I mean, what the experiment and theory was. Uh, well, Taylor looked at what is now called the Couette-Taylor experiment, and it consists of two concentric cylinders with fluid in between it. So again, just think water. And uh, you can rotate the inner and outer cylinders at a certain speed and ask what happens to the fluid. Well, that's hard to ask, uh, answer. I mean, you know, you just put water in a, flu in a beaker and you see this, you're not going to see very much. So the physicists are very clever. They uh, put uh, platelets, uh, silver platelets, into the water that go along the way the fluid is flowing. And if the uh, platelets are vertical and you shine a light, you get a nice bright reflection. And if they're horizontal, you shine a light, it's dark. And that's what these pictures are over here. So if, let's hold the outer cylinder fixed to begin with and just speed up the inner cylinder a little bit. Then what you're going to see is this picture of Kuwait flow. And you say, what picture? Well, it's very interesting that pattern is associated with what I'll call broken symmetry. I, I sorry, with, uh, with, with broken symmetry. And this very symmetric state, Kuwait flow, looks to us as if it does not have any pattern. But when you speed up the inner cylinder, what you get is this Taylor vortex state. And it's really kind of interesting. Notice how symmetric this thing is. It, it just looks like uh, rows of uh, donuts stacked one on top of each other, and you see the experiment really looks that way. If you speed the outer cylinder as well, you can start to get uh, states like the spiral state. The spiral state is time dependent. If you actually see it rotating, the spiral, it'll look like a barber pole. The spiral will just go up the uh, cylinder. And it really looks like the water is going to come out the top. Of course, the top is capped, and that's not what's moving. But nevertheless, it, it gives this sensation. Okay, so what Taylor did was ask, start with uh, the cylinder, the outer cylinder fixed, inner cylinder at rest, and speed up the inner cylinder slowly. You're going to see Kuwait flow, and then Kuwait flow will lose stability, and some other pattern will replace it. This is the uh, transition, the symmetry breaking, if you will. And he fix the, the speed of the outer cylinder and then perform the same experiment of speeding up the inner cylinder. And he plotted the points where 
the, uh, where Kuwait flow disappeared and some other state came about. And then, theoretically, in a uh, sort of tour de force for uh, 1923, remember, no computers, uh, and solving the Navier-Stokes equation wasn't all that easy. Nevertheless, he was able to do this in, uh, uh, in a numerically precise way. And he found this curve uh, where Kuwait flow would lose stability to Taylor vortices. And what you see is that in this area, it's dead on accurate. Uh, and uh, that was the first experimental confirmation of Navier-Stokes. So it comes from a change in pattern. Now, Taylor was a pretty good experimentalist, and I just want to point out that over here, uh, the loss of stability of Kuwait flow occurred before the theoretically predicted value. And the reason for that was the uh, existence of uh, the spiral vortex state that I showed you, which wasn't in his calculations. Okay, so that's one way, a uh, third way to you that patterns were studied. And now it comes the one that I'm really, uh, the reason I do study patterns and what I like about it, is that mathematics can give you a classification, uh, as you will, if you will, a menu of patterns. If you understand the situation that you're looking at, uh, the symmetry of the uh, physical situation or biological situation, then this can tell you a list of patterns, and then the physics or biology chooses from that set of patterns. Now, I'm going to do this with two examples. One uh, we've already talked about, stripes and spots in planar systems, and the other, which we haven't really discussed, oscillations in circle symmetry. So let me try to explain first the uh, planar symmetry breaking. So I imagine that I have something like the uh, Baynard convection experiment, but in the whole plane. Let's not worry about the boundaries. Uh, another way of saying this is boundaries aren't important, lateral boundaries. And now I start with a state, this pure conduction state. Well, that's the same everywhere. It's completely translation invariant. And then as you change the temperature, Something happens, you go to conduction, and a pattern forms. And what kind of patterns do you see? Theorem, stripes, or spots. These are the basic patterns that you're going to see. And that's indeed what we saw in those experiments. And this is what led Turing uh, to posit the question of uh, morphogenesis coming from pattern formation. It was in this kind of a system. And just to remind you, the stripes appeared in the sand dunes and the zebra and the convection cells, and the spots appeared in the mud plains and the leopard and the convection cells. Now, in another kind of situation, suppose I have a system which is circularly symmetric, and I have a solution or a state which is circularly symmetric, and this state somehow disappears as I change parameters. Well, here's a, uh, the, my favorite example was actually studied in the mechanical engineering department here uh, by uh, uh, Bajaz and Sethna some years back. Uh, take a hose and uh, send water through it, just let it hang vertically and send water through it. Uh, well, probably you don't want to do it outside. It better wait till spring. But in, in any case, as this water, as the flow rate increases, the uh, hose will hang down vertically, and then start, uh, some oscillation will begin. And there's two kinds of oscillation. Either the end of the hose will rotate, or the end of the hose will go back and forth in along a line. And which one depends on uh, some of the physical uh, constants in the uh, hose, which I, I, don't, I don't have to describe here. But the menu of patterns, now we have a theorem which says that if you have a circularly symmetric system, and if it loses stability, a, a circularly invariant state loses stability to oscillation, an oscillatory instability, then you will either get this rotating wave or a standing wave going back and forth. So those are the two things that you expect to happen. Well, let's go back to Gorman's experiment. Uh, remember, uh, the rotating, this is the burner is circularly symmetric. You saw that from these uh, views down on the burner. And uh, we did see this rotating wave, as you recall. Well, if the rotating wave is there, mathematics is telling you that there should also be a standing wave. 
Now, what's a standing wave? It's going to have a line of symmetry for all time. That's one way to detect it. And uh, indeed, the standing wave occurred. This is in slower motion than in the film that you saw before. Uh, it has a, it's oscillating back and forth and has this line of symmetry. Well, even in taylor Cowett, the same theorem applies. That is, if you look down here, remember I talked about the spiral waves? The spiral waves are the traveling, they're the rotating wave in this circularly symmetric system. And if you look at that spiral way, uh, the place where spiral waves exist, you could predict mathematically that there should, well, I'm going to use a funny word when, with predict, there should be a state which has a line of symmetry in this thing. Uh, should be means the state exists, but it may or may not be stable. You may not be able to see it in this physical experiment. Uh, well, uh, several mathematicians, so saw Yost and DeMay, went, and went back to the Navier-Stokes equations, did some calculations, this time with a computer, and uh, were able to find a regime uh, in this experiment where the standing wave should be stable, told the experimentalists, and they went back and they found this. So with all the experiments in the, um, on the taylor Cuet system over quite a few years, nobody had ever found this state, but it just comes out of this pattern, having this extra uh, knowledge about what states should exist. So let me just summarize this first part of the uh, talk. Uh, mathematics of pattern formation leads to a menu of patterns, and we call this a model-independent result. It doesn't depend on the specific differential equations or whatever you're going to say. It's something which uh, just comes from the structure of the system, particularly the symmetry. And on the other hand, the physics and biology of a given experiment choose from that menu, and that is a model-dependent result. And that's why you can use something like taylor Cuet. Uh, you, you can uh, to test the efficacy of the uh, Navier-Stokes equations uh, because this is uh, the transition between patterns is model dependent. Okay, so up until now, I was talking about static patterns and periodic patterns. Uh, what about more complicated patterns? So I want to talk a little bit about uh, chaotic dynamics, and let me try to explain in what sense. Uh, I'm going to look at the plane, and I suppose I have a rule or a function which takes points on the plane to points on the plane. And I choose a point in the plane, I've called it Z0 here, and I'm going to make a dynamical system out of it by taking f of Z0, call that Z1, f of Z1, call that Z2, and so on. So uh, maybe a picture helps. Uh, first of all, let's take a function. This is, I just wrote down one for fun. Uh, it has no particular uh, reason for being, except it's a nice, simple polynomial. And if I take z naught to be this 0 0.25, 0 0.26, apply f to it, believe me, this is what happens. And if you apply uh, z1 to it, you get this point over here. And you can plot this on the plane. Here is the point z naught. Z1 actually comes over here, Z2 goes over there, and if I apply F again, you end up at Z3, and F again, you end up at Z4, and points seem to be circulating around, but it's, uh, maybe you need more points to see what's going on. Uh, this, so this is 15 points, I think, 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. It, it's still not completely clear uh, what's happening. And if you want 100 points, there they are, but I'm not sure this will help you a whole lot. But this is the way we make dynamics out of a, a simple way on the plane. Given any function, you can see how these things uh, go around and try to figure out what's going to happen. Well, uh, this dynamic can be chaotic, and what a mathematician usually means by chaotic is it has sensitive dependence on initial conditions. Now, I don't want to try to define this technically. I'll do it by pictures, but you have to give me a little time to develop some more things. Okay, now I don't want to, this uh, being pattern formation, and in my mind, pattern has something to do with symmetry. I don't want to use any old function. I want to use functions that have symmetry. 
And oh, so in the plane, what are the symmetries that you could have? Well, the, the basic ones are the symmetries of a regular m-gon. So uh, the symmetries of an equilateral triangle or a square or a regular pentagon, uh, d3, d4, d5. Well, in fact, for the square, there are eight symmetries of the square, in case you hadn't thought about it. Uh, what can I do? I can take the square and do nothing. Well, that's boring, but it's like zero in uh, the number system. It's there as a symmetry. I can rotate it by 90 degrees, pick the square up, just rotate it, get the same square back, 180, 270. That's, three, that's four symmetries now, four rotational symmetries. There are also four reflections. You can reflect across any one of these four lines, and that's a symmetry of the square. So D4, this group here, has eight symmetries in it. Uh, the symmetries of a regular pentagon, there are 10 of them, and you, and you can sort of see what's going on. Now, uh, the kind of mappings that I want to use are ones that have this symmetry. That is, apply the symmetry to the point and then apply the function, or apply the function and then apply the symmetry, and you get the same thing. So the first thing is, are, do functions like this exist? Yes. There are mathematical techniques to write them down. And if you let a point in the plane be a complex number, here's an example, and you don't have to care where that came from. But you can write down formulas. But it's this kind of function that I'm going to use. And now what happens when you stick in initial points, here is triangular symmetry. You start getting these very symmetric regular pictures, m equal 5. Uh, here's an example of a picture that you see. And um, fortunately for the IMA, uh, this is where their attractor came from. Uh, this is their picture. It's, uh, this is probably with uh, about five or six million iterates. A little hard to perform uh, before you have a computer uh, to do the work. And I'll explain the colors in a moment. Well, not the particular choice of colors, but how the picture is colored. Uh, with this, uh, uh, so Mike Field, whose name appeared on the uh, previous slide, and I have been uh, playing around with these uh, things, and Mike developed the software to color the pictures in the following way. Um, you do the obvious, in a way. Uh, take one of these maps, take a point, iterate for a while, and throw it away. And now, after you've gotten rid of the transients, iterate for, you know, uh, 250 million times and count the number of times during the iteration that you visit each pixel on the computer screen, and then color by number. So the colors are representing, if you will, the probability that you'll be in that region of space during the iteration. So it has a nice mathematical interpretation. And what's not at all transparent is, OK, this white up here is indicating one time in this 250 million iterates did you come to this point. Dark blue is indicating you visited this point about 500 times. Now notice that you visit a point which is white, very close to where you visit a blue point. This structure just repeats. If I start with a different initial condition, do the same experiment, I'll get the same picture. So what's chaotic? I'll try to explain. First of all, uh, a few pictures from our gallery of uh, things that we like. Uh, now you can, I can put on an artist cap or what I conceive to be an artist, and we won't get into whether that uh, satisfies the things, but uh, we can name our pictures. So, uh, wild chaos. Uh, golden Flintstone. Now, I I'm going to use Golden Flintstone to illustrate what sensitive dependence on initial conditions means. Um, so th this picture has D3 symmetry. It has the symmetry of a regular triangle. Of course, it's not a, re a regular triangle. Uh, and the lines of symmetry of the triangle are 120 degrees off from each other. And they divide the plane into six wedges, which we have colored magenta, cyan, yellow, and so on. And now. In here, in this picture, what we're going to do is take inside this black border, take each point, and take the function which, which created golden flintstone, and 
take this point and apply the function to it, and then color the point by which wedge we end up in. So over here, a point here in the green area is taken into this green wedge. The red area is taken into this red wedge. And you can start to see how the function uh, mixes up points in the plane. And now, do this for three iterates in advance. So I start with a point here. Three iterates later, you'll be in the red. Over here, three iterates later, you'll be in the cyan, and so on. So uh, we create this. And notice that points that are near to each other are now starting to be in different wedges. Well, let's ask this question after nine iterations. And boy, this stuff is really getting mixed up. And just uh, to drive it home, after just 29 iterates of that five, 20, 250 million iterates, uh, this stuff is all mixed up. That is, if you start with points which are very close together, then after just a little while, they'll be anywhere. They'll be uncorrelated. And that's what chaotic dy dynamics really means to a, uh, to a mathematician. Okay? So these are pictures of chaotic dynamics. Nevertheless, they are quite regular. So uh, we started to um, think of some visual puns. We liked the pictures that started to appear. This reminded us of a flower, and here's St. John's wort, which uh, is well known to cure various ills, at least in the 1500s. Uh, <laughs> maybe I don't have to describe uh, you know, exactly how we got there. So this is the Pentagon attractor. Now this uh, has several features that you, I, I would like to point out to you. First of all, how do you get a picture of the Pentagon? And I'll tell you, you don't overfly it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it turns out if you write to the Air Force, they'll actually send you one to the Pentagon. So, and this was uh, Major Harrington or something who, who did this some years ago. Uh, the uh, second issue, uh, not to make a political statement here, but I want to point out that this picture has something very interesting buried away in it. Uh, you notice Darth Vader here? <laughs> so. Well, uh, you can start doing the same things, but uh, instead of uh, using just the finite symmetries I was talking about, you can make peri uh, things with periodic boundary conditions, and you start getting quilts. And I just wanted to point out a couple of quilt patterns that appear by the same process. Well, this we call hex nuts. I guess you can figure out why. But how does the mathematics know that you can, with the colors, that you're going to get this stuff that looks like rope that's just intertwined? And, and you know, I have no answer to that. Uh, but, I just, uh, but it's a lot of fun doing this sort of thing and finding out uh, what happens. Okay. Here's one of my favorites. The picture doesn't come out quite as well on the screen here. Uh, but this mosaic attractor, uh, and it just looks like something you could make out of stone. And uh, if I ever have some time and got interested, uh, this is something that might be fun to try to reproduce. OK, so uh, this was interesting patterns coming from chaotic dynamics. Can this appear in the physical world? And the answer is yes. And let me give you an example. Uh, it, it goes through something, uh, a very sophisticated piece of mathematics called the ergodic theorem. And uh, that could be called time averages equal space averages. And as long as you don't pin me down, uh, let's just leave it at that. Uh, but what it does mean, a consequence of this, is that if the attractor has some symmetry, these pictures have symmetry, that's clear then the time averages will also, of, a physical, uh, of uh, a process that's governed by this dynamics will also have that symmetry. So I'd like to use this using what's called uh, the Faraday surface wave experiment. So again, you take um, a fluid layer. This is also called the coffee cup experiment. Uh, you have a uh, fluid in a uh, layer coffee cup, if you will, and you're on a train, you put it on the table, it's vibrating up and down, and surface waves appear. And Faraday suggested that one could uh, study surface waves using this kind of experiment. Well, you have two parameters to play with. You have uh, the amplitude of the forcing up and down and the frequency, how fast you put it up and down. So uh, what, one thing that happens with the Faraday experiment is fix the frequency 
And now look at the amplitude. If the amplitude is very small, you're just going up and down a little bit, the surface will remain flat. But if you uh, go a little bit higher, then you start getting these surface waves appearing. And the study of this transition is, again, another of these pattern-forming experiments. Now, what the, uh, what the experiments are going to, experimentalists are going to do is take a light and shine it through the surface. If the surface is concave down, then the light will diffuse and you'll have a black area above it. If it's concave up, it'll focus and you'll have a white area above it. So they get shadow graph pictures like this. Square container, circle container, you can sort of see the symmetry appearing. So this is the kind of pattern that are seen at this transition. Now, if you increase the amplitude, then you start seeing this kind of picture. And this is dynamic. I don't have a movie of this, unfortunately. But the cellular structure, the cells just move around all over the place. It looks chaotic, for lack of a better word, certainly complicated. So a question is, so suppose I take the time average of the um, transmitted light, of the intensity of the transmitted light through this thing. And this is an experiment that Jerry Gollop and uh, co-workers did in the uh, early 1990s. Uh, and we suggested to him that what you should see is, a, if you take the time average, is, is something that is uh, symmetric, but not necessarily constant. And uh, this was nice because I actually won a bet uh, that uh, Jerry was convinced that it would be constant, but here's the time average. The symmetry, so this, these pictures that I was showing you tell you something about this kind of physical experiment. Okay, so in the last part of the talk, what I want to do is switch to uh, patterns in biology and neuroscience. And my favorite, as Doug mentioned at the uh, beginning, is animal gates. So as a, um, I'll, if there's time, I'll also talk a little bit about geometric visual hallucinations. But uh, animal gates, so first of all, when you walk, and you swap your legs, I know it's inconvenient to do so, but when you do, you're a half a period out of phase from where, you, uh, from where you are now. That is, a half a period later in your walk, your feet will be in the same relative position as the legs swapped. So there is this spatio-temporal symmetry, swap and shift by half a period, that is an invariant of quadruped walking, also called us. Now, there are, in four-legged animals, there's some more interesting gates. Uh, there's the bound of the Siberian suslik. You do know what a Siberian suslik is. Yeah, okay, well, that's it anyway. And uh, the bound is front, uh, what the motion is, the two front legs hit the ground, half a period later, the two rear legs, two front legs, two rear legs, and so on. Now, you may not know this, elephants amble, uh, horses and dogs walk. It's the same gait. Uh, from this picture, I uh, challenge you to figure out what the stupid animal is doing with its legs. Uh, I, it's, it's really not uh, that easy from the picture. I will tell you, however, uh, left rear, left front, right rear, right front. And it goes in that quarter period phase shift between it, go to the zoo, it's a whole new experience. Uh, and you can see what happens when these animals are walking. Now, here's another simple gait, the pace of a horse. Bo you know, there's pacers and trotters. Both pace, both left legs, both right legs. Got that? Both left legs, then half period later, both right legs hit the ground, so on. So here's a little movie that I got off the web. So, same thing in slow motion. Both left legs, both right legs, both left legs. And that's why this animal was so expensive to buy. <laughs> it is really a good pacer. Uh, but that gives you an idea of, that you can see these, these kinds of gates. Now, standard gates, uh, there are a number of them. I, I want to, we've talked about walk and pace and bound. Trot 
is this is what your dog is going to do uh, after it gets tired walking, wants to go a little faster. The diagonal legs move in unison. So right front, left rear, and left front, right rear move together, and they're a half a period out of phase. So that's the trot. Uh, the pronk, uh, you know what the pronk, all four legs together. Uh, deer like to do this. Uh, you know, especially if they're startled. Uh, but getting a picture was it proved a little bit difficult. But <laughs> hey, you know, you just got to go with what you can get. Uh, so uh, there's Garfield. Okay, now uh, the thing that I'd like to point out is that the different gates that I've just described have different symmetries. You, and this is something that uh, Jim Collins and uh, Ian Stewart observed when they started looking at these uh, problems again in the early 90s. So with a pace, if I swap, remember both left legs, both right legs. If I swap left and right, I'm a half a period out of phase, just like with the biped walk, with the human walk. If you swap front and back, there's no phase shift. It's, uh, this uh, gate looks exactly the same. Now. If you take the trot, which is similar, swap left and right, you're swapping the diagonals, so they're a half a period out of phase. Swap front and back, you're also swapping the diagonals, they're a half a period out of phase. So there's a different symmetry to the trot and the pace. And the walk is even worse because uh, you have to swap left rear to left front to right rear to right front with a quarter period phase shift to get the symmetry of the uh, walk. So these gates can be thought of as different symmetry patterns. Well, people study gates a lot. And uh, one of the things that they assume, or at least a lot of biologists assume, and a lot of other biologists say this is wrong, is that there is a central pattern generator for the rhythms of the different gates. Now, it's known that in very primitive animals, the favorite is the lamprey eel, there is a central pattern generator. That is, they can go into the neur uh, neuronal system and find the neurons uh, every time that are firing with the same cadence of the swim gate in the uh, eel. Uh, but whether central pattern generators exist in mammals or not is uh, difficult. People don't know where to look for it. But being a mathematician, I, I plead guilty, uh, let there be a central pattern generator. And, and now ask the question from knowing that these gates exist, what must the central pattern generator look like? Is there any structure to it? Or said differently, design the simplest network of neurons, because that's what the central pattern generator would be made up of, uh, which can produce the rhythms of walk, trot, and pace. And there's something interesting in mathematics. If you do the obvious and it doesn't work, you know you're onto something. So let me explain what I think the obvious is. You have four identical groups of neurons, and each one controls one leg. And now you ask, if I couple these four groups of neurons together, then can I produce a, a coupling or a pattern of coupling which will produce all three gates, walk, trot, and pace? Theorem, it's not possible. And it's also not possible for me to explain the theorem uh, right here. But uh, roughly, uh, it's, it's, it's not too hard from a symmetry point of view. You cannot do it. So we said, well, let's go back and go to an eight cell system. Two, two sets of neurons are controlling one leg. It's the next simplest thing that one can do. And let's use the symmetries that are in the gates. We have bilateral symmetry, left-right symmetries. We also have this four cycle that's associated with walk. What's the simplest system which would have both of those symmetries? And here it is. It's this system. Without going to, into any details, we can now do this argument that was the fourth part of pattern formation. What, is, what are all of the spatiotemporal patterns of periodic solutions that ex can exist in this kind of a network. And that's the kind of mathematical question that we can answer. And it turns out that there are six primary ones. Uh, there's pronk and pace and trot and bound and walk. And then there's the sixth one, which we label jump. But let me explain what the gate is, and you'll see our, why we're a little perplexed. Um, 
front legs down at time zero in the gate, rear legs down at time one quarter, and that it's not until three quarters of a period later that the front legs come down again. So remember, the bound is front, back, front, back, equal time. And this is front, back, wait a while, front, back, wait a while, front, back. So, so uh, we had never seen anybody talk about such a gate. But now it's important that uh, I introduce at the beginning that I was from Houston, because one of the cultural high points in the city of Houston, and it's going on right now, is the Houston uh, Livestock and Rodeo Show. So well, thanks. You said as well as Pete Hawkins rides. 80 big points. Here's one of the two leaders tied. Okay, but uh, now in slow motion. What? Okay. Front, back, wait a while, front, back, wait a while, front, back. Well, you know, we just went to the rodeo to have fun. And uh, there we are trying to count uh, without much success. But there was this um, instant replay. So after three months of intense negotiation with the rodeo, where I had to sign a statement that I would not use this for commercial purposes, uh, they uh, let, and then we uh, went through and put it on the, uh, my son helped me, and we put it on uh, uh, the computer and went frame by frame. So when uh, this thing hits blue, this is where the front legs hit the ground. Frame 75 is where the rear legs are firmly planted on the ground. 109 front legs hit again, and so on. We took, not very scientific, but we averaged the length of the front to back and the frac to front, took the ratio. If it were a bound, that ratio would be one, approximately. If it's this jump, it would be three. And for a non-controlled experiment, uh, this is pretty good. Uh, later on, we found that, uh, in fact, some gate analysts had actually seen this kind of motion in gerbils and rats. And it's on page 274 of a 300-page book by Gambarian. Uh, but uh, he calls it a primitive ricocheting jump. But it's interesting that just by knowing some of the information of the system, then you can get a menu of these patterns. The expectation is that all of that menu will appear somewhere. And indeed, that is a kind of prediction that comes out of this. Now, there's a couple of, I, I want to tie up a loose end. Why two cells to one leg? I mean, what, is there a physiological basis for this? Well, let's go back to bipeds. The, uh, let's assume that this network is the simplest one that works, the theorem it is, uh, and then the biped network would have this kind of structure. Two cells, uh, two neurons or two groups of neurons sending their signals to the left leg, two to the right leg. And in such a system, mathematically, you get two kinds of, <coughs> you get two kinds of gates where when you swap your legs, you're a half a period out of phase, like the walk. So question, is there another gate that you know of when you swap your legs, you're a half a period out of phase? And uh, if you think about it, there's the run. Now, it's well known anatomically that walk and run are different gates. When you walk, you're using your leg as a pendulum. When you run, the power is coming from the... Uh, uh, quadriceps, and you're going up and down, it's more or less as a pogo stick. Uh, so uh, can this be tested? And the answer is yes. Um, and there have been experiments by uh, neuroscientists where they uh, put uh, devices into the muscles around, in this case, the ankle joint. Now, why the ankle joint? Because when you walk, you rotate your uh, ankle joint. So the two signals, well, okay, so this took us a little while, uh, but uh, Jim Collins, who's a um, biomechanician, pointed out any joint has two muscle groups attached to it, flexors and extensors. They happen to be, if you're interested, gastronemius and tibialis anterior. Uh, I practice that a lot. Uh, and in the, if they're going to be uh, rotating your ankle joint, they have to fire out of phase. If you're going to hold your ankle rigid, as in a, um, 
um, pogo stick, then they have to co-activate, and that's exactly what happens. So here we have a symmetry uh, explanation of the difference between walk and run. We also have a resolution of the problem why two controls for each leg, because you're not controlling legs, you're controlling joints and muscle groups. And you need to have two for each one. So uh, we have this theorem that I like to paraphrase as, and it, you'll understand that this is really quite a deep mathematical theorem, that in order for quadrupeds to walk, trot, and pace, they have to have muscles. <laughs> so, but uh, the consequence is that, that that's a minimum design in this whole thing. Let's see, how are we doing? Oh, yeah, okay. So uh, I like, the last example I'd like to show you is the uh, geometric visual hallucinations. Uh, so uh, in the 1950s uh, and uh, earlier, Kluver, who was a uh, professor at Chicago, uh, studied the different kinds of patterns that appear when people ingest hallucinations drugs. This is an experiment that could not be performed today. Uh, even though I think he performed it mostly on himself, uh, it was, uh, it, it's probably, but, but if you want to do one that is legal still, um, phosphines, um, this thing is, if you are bored with the lecture, just hold your finger over your eyeballs and press down for a little while and this pattern should appear. Uh, uh, but, uh, I, I, you know, I, this comes without any, uh, uh, well, anyway, okay. So uh, here are the kinds of patterns that Kluver found. He called them, uh, these are funnels, uh, these are the spirals, the honeycomb pattern, and a cobweb. And uh, Jack Cowan and Bart Ehrmantraud in the 1980s had this idea. Look at the visual cortex. Imagine that the drug, what the drug is doing is uniformly stimulating the whole cortex. Now, what does that mean? Um, the cortex consists of neurons. The neurons have a certain activity rate, firing rate. And when the uh, drug stimulates it, one can imagine the firing rates changing. Well, in particular, let's say the cortex is uniform, everything's firing the same way. You're getting no visual image. And now the drug comes in and a pattern forms in just the way that I've described. Then you should, if you don't worry about lateral boundaries of the, uh, cort uh, on the cortex, you should see these stripes and spots that I talked about earlier on. And if, well, you say, well, okay, suppose the pattern forms, what would you see? Well, the, the presumption is that what you would see in your mind's eye is the pattern in the outside world that would stimulate the cortex in precisely the way that this pattern is. And remarkably enough, neuroscientists have figured out how to make that translation, at least to first order, from the outside world to the uh, cortex. It's a long story, and I don't want to try to explain it here. But uh, what you have is a way of transitioning. And what happens is you get two of the four patterns here. You'll get uh, the funnels and the honeycombs. The other two patterns, where do they come from? Turns out the cortex has some structure. The visual, uh, in, uh, the visual cortex is right uh, under your, uh, this, your skull, about here. And uh, the neurons in there are sensitive to directions in the outside world. And uh, putting this all together of how it's sensitive to directions uh, got some people named Hubel and Weasel some Nobel Prizes. So, I mean, it's really fundamental uh, biosciences work, neuroscience work. And if you build that into the model, it turns out you change the symmetries in ways that, again, I won't explain here. But when you do, uh, and go through this, here are images that were computed mathematically. And now I'd just like to, to compare them to these. So uh, we do have this uh, sense that uh, the structure that Hubel and Weasel posited really begins to make sense. And again, we use these, these patterns to try to uh, show that this is the case. 
Okay, so some conclusions from all of this. We know that patterns appear in many physical and biological systems, and I would like to argue that many of them have their genesis in the mathematics of symmetry, and uh, some of the examples are up there. That we can use symmetry patterns in systems with different, uh, with different physics, uh, to, they can have the same mathematical description. So this is where the mathematics comes in and unifies many different areas in applications. And finally, that complicated patterns, in fact, can actually be built out of relatively simple state, uh, uh, in relatively simple ways. Uh, the symmetric chaos is actually a very simple process to produce very complicated dynami uh, dynamics. Similarly, uh, the patterns of animal gates can be understood from, uh, from, in the grand scheme of things, a relatively simple mathematical calculation, at least uh, at gross level. Thank you. I walked up here carefully. Whenever I hear a talk on animal gates and start to think how I walk, <laughs> I start to trip. I think uh, Professor Golubitsky will take a few questions. Uh, before he does, let me just mention a couple of things. There's a table here and also one in the middle area where you can have a souvenir postcard and all of this lecture and also a postcard uh, which is advertising our next and last lecture in this year's series, which will be on Wednesday, April 18th, by the head of theory and, and also the head of mathematics at Microsoft, Jennifer Tour Chase, on epidemics in technological and social networks or the downside of six degrees of separation. Uh, we also have a poster um, for the whole lecture series. So thank you very much for coming. Are there any questions for Professor Golubitsky? Yeah, okay, so the question is what about hexapods, uh, hexap and for that matter, centipedes and millipedes? Uh, yeah, the same kind of mathematics gives you some discussion. For example, um, uh, the standard gate for hexapods, uh, better known as cockroaches, a well-known animal in Houston, uh, is uh, a tripod gate. That is, uh, the front and rear legs on the left side and the center leg on the right side move in unison and the reverse, and they go half and half. So uh, that kind of a gate would come out of this analysis, and you can do the same sort of thing. Uh, it's, uh, the, the more legs, the more complexity uh, the, of the uh, gates that uh, show up. I'll point out that if you go to the IMA webpage, www.ima.umn.edu, You'll see there a hexapod robot that was invented. It came out of work that happened at the IMA at a workshop that Marty Golubitsky, I believe, helped to organize. Is That's that right? right? Yeah, yeah. A fantastic robot with movies of it bounding, pronging, jumping, pacing. It's an amazing thing that mm -hmm. came out of this kind of uh, mathematical research. And actually, there are some consideration that it'll be sent on a mission to Mars. It's such a powerful w walker. Another question? Uh, yeah, so the question is, can uh, mathematics help uh, to design uh, better patterns in our sociology or in, la uh, in law? Uh, you know, it, it, would it be all right if I just pass on this? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know whether one could seriously uh, try to address these things. It, it's, a, it's certainly an interesting question, uh, and I haven't thought about it, so I'd hate to sort of uh, do it on the fly here. Now, people have uh, used, uh, been interested in chaotic dynamics uh, and legal uh, uh, scholarship. I, I've seen some lectures on that uh, a while ago. Uh, whether they've gone anywhere or not, I just don't know. Maybe I can't has, help but put in one word. The laws of economics have certainly learned a lot from mathematics, and there's a lot to learn still. No, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. One last question? Or 
Okay, well, there's oh, one, wait. and then let's yep. call it a night. Ah, yeah. Um, so, the, yeah, so the question was, uh, what about the patterns in dancing, for example, square dancing or uh, English dancing or things like that? Uh, yeah, th there have been some attempts, though uh, I haven't followed it very much. Uh, I, but I, I, there, the mathematics, I'm talking about group theory here uh, of symmetries, has been used to dis help describe uh, different kinds of dance. Uh, I, I can't off the top of my head tell you what the kinds of results they have. But again, it's this classification thing. Uh, but it's not, it's, it's that plus uh, information because uh, lots of different dance steps can have the same symmetry. So you can, uh, and, and so you have to be a little bit careful in the classification. Good question. Okay, thank you very much and be careful as you prong and bound and pace your way home. <laughs> <laughs>